Throughout this video, the words dysautonomia, orthostatic intolerance, autonomic disorder, and autonomic dysfunction are at times used interchangeably to refer to the medical condition known as postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. While all of these conditions are related, there are slight variances in symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment. Please consult your doctor for more information. This is Alexia. At the age of 16, Alexia developed extreme fatigue and a very high heart rate. Her doctor believed it was just anxiety, but the symptoms persisted and got even worse. Four years later, Alexia lost consciousness and was taken to the emergency room. After that, Alexia endured countless tests while doctor after doctor struggled to diagnose her. Finally, after numerous misdiagnoses and a cardiac ablation, Alexia went to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where physicians figured out that she suffered from a condition known as Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome, or POTS. Alexia is 26 years old now and has needed to make major adjustments in her life in order to manage her symptoms, which change dramatically from one day to the next. Alexia's story is all too familiar to those people who have been diagnosed with POTS. For them, the simple act of standing upright can make their heart race, can make them lightheaded and sweaty, and can even make them faint. In this video, you will hear facts and testimonies about POTS from four people. Dr. Svetlana Blitchstein, who specializes in treating autonomic disorders from her private practice in New York. Dr. Randy Thompson, who has treated POTS patients for the last eight years and who himself was diagnosed with POTS in 1997. Autumn Austin, who was diagnosed with POTS five years ago and lives in Michigan with her husband and two sons. And Shannon Donegan, a senior in high school who was diagnosed with POTS when she was 15 years old. Because POTS has only recently been recognized as a medical condition, and because the symptoms of POTS are very similar to the symptoms of other conditions, in particular anxiety disorders, there are many misconceptions among patients and doctors alike. There are many myths in general medical community about POTS, and generally many doctors do not understand what POTS is or what autonomic disorder is or dysautonomia is. So I'll start first by saying that the biggest problem we face today is that there is still, after 20 years of identification of this disorder and definition and diagnosis for it, that there is still lack of knowledge that POTS exist by many physicians. You know, first of all, we are not talking about nerves here. We're not talking about psychiatric. We're not talking about people having these anxiety disorder or whatever because about 85 percent of people up till about five years ago were diagnosed with an anxiety disorder before they found out that they had POTS. First thing I tell them is that you know this has nothing to do with anxiety we're not talking about nerves per se that there are several different nervous systems in the body. If I take this pen and lay it down and tell you to pick it up then you're gonna have to think about it to pick it up and that's called the somatic nervous system. Uh, everybody's familiar with the pain nervous system and how that works. What we're talking about it is the autonomic nervous system. Now the autonomic nervous system, a better way to think about it is the automatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system covers everything in your body that's not under your conscious control. It controls temperature regulation, it controls sweating, it controls the way your pupils dilate and constrict, uh, it controls your tear glands and your salivary glands, it controls your breathing, both how fast you breathe and the way your bronchial tubes dilate. Uh, it controls your heart rate, it controls the strength and contraction of your heart, but it also controls the stomach, the bowels, the bladder, and the sexual function. When everybody, whether they have this condition or not, when you stand up, you're going to put about 500 to 800 cc's of blood into your legs. That's about 25 or 30 ounces. What happens is when it pulls in the legs, it activates the sympathetic nervous system, the blood vessels will constrict, and then the blood vessels in this area are all supposed to, supposed to constrict. It'll keep the blood pushed out and it'll maintain blood flow to the brain. 
the simple version of what happens in dysautonomia is you stand up, you pull the blood in the legs. In fact, you pull even a little bit more blood in the legs. But these blood vessels in here don't constrict, so they stay wide open. The gravity continues to work against you. It pulls blood to the area of least resistance, which are these dilated blood vessels, and the only place it can come from is higher up, and that's why you start down this cascade of symptoms, so that if you reach 20%, you're gonna end up passing out. If you lose 3% of the blood flow to your brain, you'll know something's going on. It may be irritability, it may be a concentration problem. If you lose 5% of the blood flow, you may start having chest discomfort and I may get a headache. If you lose 8% of the blood flow, you may start getting nauseated and I may get dizzy. If you lose 20% of the blood flow to your brain, then your body's gonna make you get flat. And as strange as it sounds, passing out is not a dangerous condition. Passing out is actually a protective mechanism of the body. You know, it's not the passing out, it's hitting your head on the door or the desk and the floor and that kind of thing. I tell everybody if I pass out one more time, they're gonna make me wear a football helmet around it. It was once estimated that 500,000 of Americans were affected by POTS, but recently it's estimated that more than a million of Americans are affected. And some of it is really because patients are misdiagnosed with other conditions or yet undiagnosed. Anybody can get POTS, but typically age ranges between 15 and 50 years of age. Children can also get POTS, so can older adults. Furthermore, women are affected much more uh, by POTS than men, and the ratio is approximately 5 to 1. A second myth is that POTS only affects heart rate and blood pressure. This is simply not true. POTS is a multidimensional disorder. Uh, it covers many symptoms and it affects many systems of the body. That's why it's important to have a team of physicians knowledgeable about POTS. That includes primary care physician, cardiologist, neurologist, gastroenterologist if there is a GI involvement, urologist if patients have a bladder problem, finally a sleep disorder specialist if patients have a sleep disorder. When POTS was first discovered, it was felt that it was strictly a viral type syndrome that would affect the, the norepinephrine receptors in the splenic area. Now they're finding more and more things that can cause it and more and more things that, that can lead into it or aggravate it. Etiology of uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is still being worked out. Uh, what we do know is that presumed etiology and mechanism involve several factors. Number one is neuropathic. POTS can be thought of as a limited form of autonomic neuropathy. And what neuropathy means is that uh, nerves in the peripheral nervous system, small fibers as we call them, those that control autonomic functions, and those nerves that also control pain, those nerves can get involved. It is estimated that approximately half of patients with POTS have this type of etiology. Another etiology and mechanism is hyperadrenergic POTS. And what that means is that the body for patients with this type of POTS produces more epinephrine and norepinephrine than a normal individual. About one third of patients have this type of etiology. Hypovolemic POTS uh, refers to a term where blood volume and uh, urine sodium uh, is low. And it's estimated that another third of patients with POTS have hypovolemic etiology. It's important to mention that a patient with POTS can have more than one etiology and mechanism. And it's also important to understand that more research is being done to gain better understanding of causes of this disorder. As y'all probably know, they're doing a lot of research now and they're beginning to find that there is, in some people, a genetic component of it. In fact, I've got a daughter who has POTS. There has been clinical evidence that certain patients with POTS have genetic predisposition for it. That is not to say that POTS is a genetic disorder, it's not yet, and we don't have the uh, genes for it identified, but we do know that sometimes POTS does run in families. 
The onset of POTS can often be linked to a single health-related event, for example, a viral sickness or surgery, or it can develop slowly over a period of years. Furthermore, people with POTS often have other conditions as well. One example is joint hypermobility syndrome, where faulty or reduced amounts of collagen allow for hypermobility of joints, as well as other symptoms. Joint hypermobility syndrome is one of many conditions often found in conjunction with POTS. Oftentimes we say that POTS is life-altering and not life-limiting. Um, however, again, that creates many problems for patients who have POTS. Sometimes patients are not taken seriously because their condition is not lethal. However, just like with other chronic disorders, including diabetes, asthma, or rheumatoid arthritis, patients with POTS deserve proper care and deserve management of their symptoms and improvement in the quality of their life. The most disabling symptom is fatigue. Uh, and fatigue is not just a, a, a sensation of tiredness that people get when they exercise or maybe they didn't get a good night's sleep. This is a profound, severe and debilitating sensation of exhaustion that patients with autonomic disorders get with minimal or no physical activity. Gastrointestinal symptoms can also occur, and they're very common, including nausea, vomiting, bloating, abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, and constipation. Symptoms of urinary bladder can also occur, whether overactive bladder or neurogenic bladder. Alterations in sweating, decreased sweating, increased sweating can also occur. Sleep disturbance is also common, and it occurs in about a third of patients with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Other features include migraine, myofascial pain, and just generally feeling unwell on a daily basis. Syncope or fainting is not required for the diagnosis, but in fact 20% of patients with spots can also faint. Another common myth about POTS is that POTS is just a nuisance, not serious. This cannot be farthest from the truth. In fact, if you talk to any patient with POTS, they'll tell you that their life is severely affected. I definitely was just your average kid. I was perfectly healthy. There's, there's no sign that I would be sick. It came, like, it came on really fast and unexpected. She didn't even really have a lot of the typical earaches, you know, where they had to have a lot of antibiotics or anything like that. She was just a normal, healthy kid. And even in, I think it was grade four, she got, like, a certificate for not missing one day of school. She was so healthy, like, she didn't have one sick day. <laughs> so she was, you know, she was great. Until grade eight. <laughs> Until grade eight. Grade eight. One night I woke up in the middle of the night and I was really nauseous and dizzy and at first we just thought it was a stomach flu but um, it basically just didn't go away. I still normally always feel queasy like even if it's a good day like I'll feel nauseous to some extent so I mean I never really forget that it's there and if I do even for a second I mean my body will remind me if I like try to do too much. I began to get this just humongous fatigue. I mean, I couldn't get out of bed. I'd get up, I'd make it into the bathroom, which is about 30 feet away, and I'd lay down in the bathroom floor. I'd get up, get in the shower, I'd take a shower, lean up against the wall to wash my hair, get out of the shower, lay down in the bathroom floor again, start drying my hair and brushing my teeth sitting in the floor. I'd get up, get dressed, drive to work, see three out of 30 patients, and tell, call my nurse in there and say, I cannot get out of this chair, I absolutely, I can't get up, I can't see any more patients. 
when I first began to really suspect that there was a problem was uh, one summer night in August, I can remember very vividly, it was about 3.30 in the morning, I woke up and had a very rapid heart rate, uh, profuse sweating, um, this and just terrible feeling of doom. And I did not know what was wrong with me at all. There are not words that can describe the debilitation of this. Family members continue to this day to say, you couldn't possibly feel that bad. You look fine. You don't look sick. You look good. Accept it. Enjoy it. And I'm feeling terrible. If I hear one more time how good I look, I'd like to punch somebody in the face. I really would. Because what you want to say is if you could feel like I'm feeling right now, you wouldn't say that I look good. The biggest thing I think for most people with POTS is that we look fine. So a lot of people figure we are fine. But I mean, just because you can't see it doesn't mean you're not feeling pretty much like complete crap. If I could have just one thing to tell people is please be understanding. Understand that there's something going on in this person's life and even though you don't have diabetes and you don't have cancer, you don't have high blood pressure, whatever, this is a medical condition that can be just as disabling as any of those kind of conditions. Shannon, Autumn, and Dr. Thompson have all needed to make major life changes in order to manage their symptoms. And there are other people who have faced even more extreme debilitation. Some POTS patients need to use wheelchairs because they lack the strength to stand. Others require full-time care and frequent hospital visits. The range of symptoms and their impact is quite broad. We also have many stereotypes in medicine, unfortunately, and the biggest stereotype is that if a young woman presents with multiple complaints, she has many symptoms, she doesn't feel well, uh, she's tired, she doesn't function. Her basic blood tests and her basic workup is unremarkable. And thus many physicians jump, jump to a conclusion that she must be anxious, depressed, or stressed, or hormonal. This is simply not true. These women have a real medical disorder that has to be diagnosed and treated properly. There is a great shortage of physicians who understand or specialize in autonomic disorders. And this creates a big problem for patients. They often have to travel to another city or even other states to get properly diagnosed and managed. On an average, it takes several months for people to get diagnosed with this. And some people I've had that I know they've had it for 10, 12, 15 years at a minimum, and they're just now finding out what they've got. A year and a half of uh, testing and uh, we had like probably like five different diagnoses and um, before we actually got POTS and they just keep diagnosing me with just like random things that wouldn't really uh, that couldn't really give the symptoms to the extent that I was having them. I think one of the first ones was they thought maybe she had appendicitis because of the pain and of course that was ruled out and then another doctor who saw her thought it was uh, cysts on the ovaries. Cysts on the ovaries. Again, because of the pain she had in her abdomen. And he said, oh, I'm sure that's what it is. Another doctor, he thought it was um, just acid reflux. Mm. It's like we even went to a naturopath and we went to a Chinese herbal doctor. Mm. We, we were trying everything and we were trying to get answers. They keep being like, okay, we found out what it is. And I was like, oh, thank God. But it ended up like they try to treat whatever they thought it was and it just, I wasn't getting any better. Oh, there you are, doctor. How is she? What's the matter with her? A badly upset stomach. No fever. Keep her quiet and make a rest. They definitely had a square peg that they were determined to fit in the round hole. They were determined to come up with something for it, and it just kept going on with blood tests, more tests. I mean, the list just went on. There were many times when I just felt like I was never going to get the correct answer. 
there there was a time when I just thought I'm just gonna be living like this the rest of my life I don't know what's wrong I know something's wrong they don't know what's wrong some of them don't believe something's wrong I would get well you know you have an anxiety disorder there's this end of the spectrum which is the low end and there's this end which is the high end you're here and I would say but how do you explain the heart rate and how do you explain the profuse sweating? Oh, that's all part of it. Oftentimes, uh, patients are misdiagnosed with anxiety disorder when in fact what they have is a disorder of the autonomic nervous system. There are several reasons for that. Number one is lack of education, that POTS is a medical condition with its own diag diagnostic criteria that requires testing and evaluation and management. Another reason is that anxiety is mediated by the same output system, autonomic nervous system, that in fact malfunctions in autonomic disorders. So many physicians are confused. Even after I was officially diagnosed, I still had the same physician say, well, that's pretty much what I was telling you before. It's an anxiety disorder and now you're depressed because you have this and you're not coping with it. Well, I got a little confused and I asked my cardiologist, uh, did I misunderstand? And she said, no, you didn't. He's incorrect. Just like anxiety is a symptom of hyperthyroidism or overactive thyroid, anxiety can also be a symptom of POTS. But anxiety is certainly not the cause of POTS. If a person suddenly becomes ill, they don't function, whereas previously they were healthy and well and athletic, of course, you know, having multiple symptoms on a daily basis will generate anxiety and sometimes depression. In fact, depression is common in, in any chronic illness, whether it's diabetes uh, or whether it's autonomic dysfunction. And many physicians have to resort to a diagnosis of anxiety disorder because they just simply don't understand what's wrong with these patients. This is why education is very important, both in medical school and in residence training. It wasn't until the ninth grade or actually the beginning of 10th grade that I took the tilt test which determined that I had POTS. A lot of people when you first mention tilt table they think they're going to go in and they're going to get strapped down, they're going to be put in through all kinds of gyrations, they're going to be you know stood up, they're going to be put side to side, they're going to be put head down. And the tilt test is basically you go from a lying position to and they basically have you lying for about 20 minutes and then they're monitoring your heart rate and blood pressure and they put you in an upright position and see how much it changes. After we do some baseline blood pressures, EKG on you, we will tilt you up to 80 degrees and they'll take your heart rate and blood pressure every 30 seconds for the first three minutes, then they'll do it at five minutes and they'll do it every five minutes. And in a normal person, it doesn't change more than uh, probably about 20 beats per minute. But in someone with POTS, it's 30 or more. And for me, um, from lying to standing, it was, it went from I think 110 to 190. If people have symptoms to the point that they are about to pass out, we have them tell it. And I don't care if you're up for three minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, or 43 minutes, we can we will have them put them back down because like I said, I don't need people to pass out to get a good test. You're not looking to see if people pass out for this to be a positive test. Many doctors can diagnose POTS by using what is called the poor man's tilt test, where a patient's blood pressure and heart rate are measured while they are lying down, and then again at intervals when they are standing. This test is especially important for diagnosing POTS in areas where tilt tables are not available. When I was doing the tilt test, when they had put me in the upright position, basically all the symptoms that I had been feeling for the past year and a half like started to, to show themselves. So I was getting really dizzy, really nauseous, and kind of blacking out a bit, and getting a bit of a headache. And so that was, it was it, in a way, it was pretty cool to see how like that brought on all of the symptoms. So that, that definitely told me that, okay, I think this is probably what it is. After a POTS diagnosis, many patients find that they enter into a grieving process. Yeah, the question is about the, 
feeling like almost like this is a death process and dealing with dying and dealing with, with grief. And yeah, I find that uh, both with myself and with patients that most people do go through that. Don't worry, the doctor says. Yeah, it's easy to say when you're healthy. As for me, I, I might as well give up. I'm no good to myself or my family now. But you do go through those phases and you go through them with your family and you go through them with your friends and all your significant others, they go through the same thing. But yes, I've been through the entire gamut of the, the stages of grief, of getting angry and getting depressed and, and the denial and turn around wanting to blame somebody else. Once I was diagnosed with PETS, I think immediately I was relieved. I had a little bit of denial and then it came. It just came to me. Um, I accepted it. I've already been living with the symptoms. This is what it is. Um, I can't change the anatomy of my body, but I can change the way I deal with it. Right now, there is no approved medication for POTS. There is no diagnosis code for POTS. Right now, we're in such an early stage of this, we're still trying to define the disease, much less the treatment. Currently, there is no drug that is FDA approved for POTS. The drugs that we use in patients with POTS come from other conditions and their use in those situations. For example, we have Florinef. We use that in POTS, but originally Florinef uh, was designed for patients with Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency. One thing you have to realize is that no matter when you have POTS or you have dysautonomia, orthostatic intolerance, you know, all those things we use interchangeably. But when you have that condition, there's not anything I can give you that's going to totally control the pooling of the blood. Treatment for POTS is not curative. There is no cure for POTS. We do have treatment, both medication and non-medication treatment that alleviates symptoms, but it's not 100%. Florinef has been commonly used for patients with autonomic disorders, uh, and it's a medication that increases uh, salt reabsorption at the kidney level and thus expands uh, blood volume. Beta blockers can also be used and these include propranolol, atenolol, and metoprolol. They decrease heart rate and they're useful for some patients but not all. Mydodrine is another drug that we have and it's an alpha vasoconstrictor. It constricts blood vessels peripherally and improves and increases blood pressure that way. The good thing about mydodrine is that it, it doesn't act centrally and it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, so the side effects on a central level um, are less than with some of the other medications. Mestinon is an old drug that we use in myasthenia gravis, and mestinon hel helps to regulate the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and lower heart rate and improves autonomic nervous system function. Clonidine is a drug that acts centrally and decreases sympathetic discharges at the central brain level. It is very helpful in patients who have this hyperadrenergic or autonomic overactivity. Another category that has recently been used with with good results is called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. These drugs are used for depression among other things, but they're also used in patients with spots, not because they have depression, but because they modulate the level of serotonin and norepinephrine in the nervous system. While butrin is another medication that is used in depression and anxiety disorders, but it's used in POTS for another reason. We don't precisely know why it works, but again, it seems to affect important neurotransmitters such as dopamine in the brain and improve symptoms. Stimulants can also be used, specifically Ritalin, Concerta, um, Dexedrine have been used with good results, partially because they have vasoconstrictive effect and they improve and increase blood pressure. Provigil is a relatively new medication that has been approved by FDA for daytime somnolence. And Provigil can be helpful in certain patients with spots because it improves 
wakefulness. One other uh, treatment modality that seems to be helpful in some patients is called epigen, and it's a subcutaneous injection. Some patients feel that epigen has been extremely helpful to them because it improves and increases red blood cell production. Epigen is not without side effects and it, do it doesn't benefit all patients with spots. That's why it's important to individualize treatment uh, based on each individual case. When, when I first got my, um, you know, a for sure diagnosis after the correct tests were done, uh, I was started on various medications. You name it, and I've tried it pretty much. But if you ask me right now for my dysautonomia, I take Cymbalta, I take Theophylline. I'm on Clonidine, Mestinon. I take Clonidine, I take Stratera. Wellbutrin, Lexapro. And then I take, like I said, the Clonazepam at bedtime. I'm on a, a medicine called Mitodrin, which is a vasoconstrictor, so it helps pump the blood. I'm also on a, an antidepressant because of, not because of depression, but because the serotonin levels in the brain, they tend to find that if that evens out, uh, it helps POTS. What people don't realize is that the serotonin receptors in the brain help control blood pressure also and heart rate and they're very sensitive to the serotonin. If you flood the brain with serotonin, then you're gonna desensitize those, in, those serotonin reuptake inhibitors to the serotonin so that when the serotonin's released, you don't get the huge fluctuations in heart rate and, and blood pressure. It has nothing to do with depression. We don't think that there's depression that's leading into this or causing any of this. There actually is a biochemical basis for using those. It's important to remember that Patients with autonomic disorders are very sensitive to medications. Thus, you have to start on a very low dose, on a pediatric dose sometimes, and increase as tolerated to maximize benefits and to minimize side effects. We are trying different medications to see uh, which ones would work, and we're having a lot of trouble getting the right combination of medicine because uh, a lot of people with POTS have, it's not just, it's not the same for everyone. A lot of people need different medicine. Treatment is a trial and error approach, means you have to try many medications until you find what works for you. It is a constant adjustment and I initially got a little bit frustrated with that, waiting for the medicines to work. And um, I found you have to give it time, but you cannot rely solely on the medicines you have to also do the things that are non-medicinal. We have those that are called non-pharmacologic measures, which are non-medication treatment. And everyone with spots should um, implement those. These include volume expansion with fluids and liquids such as Gatorade, Pedialyte, and water. People with pots have to drink a lot of water. Drinking water, everyone says drink water. With Pots, you need to drink a lot of water. That's the biggest thing, you know, you tell everybody you gotta drink, you gotta drink, gotta drink. Yes, I have to go to the bathroom. I go to the bathroom between every patient, just about. I'm fixing to have to ask you to stop the camera so I can go. Wherever I go, I bring a bottle of water with me and sometimes crackers or something like that. Another very important aspect is salt intake. Unfortunately, like I said, I live alone. My bed looks like a pantry, but I've got pretzels and I've got potato chips. I have, uh, like, they're like long socks, and they it basically what it does, they're really tight, so it pushes, helps push the blood back up. Do you notice the whole time I've been talking to you, I have my feet up on my desk, that's so that the blood doesn't pool in my legs. Leg strengthening exercise where resistance training causes your muscles to increase in mass and bulk and improves venous return to the heart and improves your circulation and standing ability. There are many ways to manage the symptoms of POTS. For example, the use of a cooling vest can help to lower body temperature in a hot environment. A knowledgeable doctor can recommend many non-pharmacologic treatment options. It's important to discuss these options with a physician who understands autonomic disorders and knows how to approach POTS.
It is also important to avoid certain activities and environments whenever possible. I had developed this phobia about going into the shower. I would get in the shower and uh, within minutes of being in there, and I took hot showers, I was feeling out of breath and my heart would pound. Washing your hair in the shower, I get more people passing out washing their hair than just about anything. When you put your hands above your head, you constrict these veins that bring blood back into the heart. So now you're decreasing the blood flow back even more. So that'll cause you to pass out. I have to plan like what I'm doing and if I'm going out, how am I gonna get home? Like I can't take really long bus rides or like, I can't go, say, shopping for like more than an hour or two without getting pretty sick. I mean, a simple trip down to Montreal, an hour and a half from Ottawa, could take three, three and a half, four hours, because we'd have to pull over because Shannon uh, was so nauseous. Laundry is probably one of the more difficult things. Uh, Smaller basket size, smaller loads. Avoidance of prolonged upright posture is also the key. This is not to say that uh, patients should completely avoid being upright, but moderation is very important. Uh, my new routine is usually just to lay on the floor and fold laundry. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but it works. I'm a lot luckier than a lot of people though because I get a lot of patients who come through here and I have had this lead to divorce. I have people who come in all the time who are very stressed. I bring the spouse in, whether it's husband or wife, and not to be sexist, but it's usually the husband who doesn't believe. The wives are usually, if the guy has it, the wives are usually great. It's the husbands who say, you know, she doesn't cook, she doesn't clean, she doesn't get out, we don't do things anymore. And I try to explain to them, you know, that they can't. That when they feel like doing it, they'll do it. But you can't expect them to do everything and then still, you know, go out and party and all this kind of stuff. One of the biggest adjustments in having pets is not only how it affects me, but also how it affects my husband and my children. And my husband has been very supportive. It's been a little bit more difficult with my children. Some of the more difficult days have really frightened them. They had a hard time with that. They weren't sure what was happening to mom. And they now have become more accepting. Uh, they do a little bit more housework than maybe they want to do, but they're very good about it. In my case, my family has been real supportive. Where I've had problems, to be honest with you, is other doctors, friends. Um, you know, I've lost some fairly close friendships because of this. Not lost them, but they've been very strained because they they don't believe in the condition, and it's more like um, you know, suck it up, go. You'll get your second wind. They don't realize that you don't get a second wind in this. Or come on, Randy, let's go play golf. And I can't do it, it's too hot out there. Well, they just finally quit asking you to go. It was hard at first because like, since we were five, we'd always, we'd done a lot together. And she's always very loud and very outgoing and we'd hang out, you know, every weekend. And then when she started getting sick, it was like, we couldn't do that as much. And it started to be the point where she'd always be in bed or she'd always be sick and we couldn't go out. After she got sick, like she just totally shut down and she really like, she didn't really talk as much, she didn't do anything and... It was really hard at first, just dealing with it and trying to realize like it's not... Not like getting mad at her, we're just getting frustrated with the situation, I think. I don't know, for a 13 year old, it's probably like the first reaction is like, oh, maybe she just doesn't want to hang out with me. And then like, after over time, you're like, no, like this is probably affecting her a lot more than it just bothers me, so like, it's just being there for your friends. But like, from then to now, it's like she's a completely different person. She's so act like she's so much more active now, and she's just she's so much happier now than she used to be. Shannon is a girl who doesn't go to school. It's not because she's ugly or because she's not cool. Shannon's got an illness, and a lot of people don't know because the symptoms don't always show. 
There are some people who think she's just faking, but that's just because they're ignorant. One day we hope she'll grow out of it, but until then, we'll just keep saying Shannon has Ideally, I'd like to be either a vet technician or work in media arts, but uh, with POTS, I'd say it'd probably be pretty hard to do that. It's not the end of my life. It's just, it has to be more creative. It has to be a little bit different. One of my cardiologists has said this is, hope is probably the most powerful medicine and when you lose hope you lose everything. I'm just gonna see how things go and hope that it'll improve enough for me to do that but if not I mean I, I still have a good life I think so I'll be able to find something else and work around it. While research is being done on new ways to alleviate the symptoms of both mild and extreme cases of POTS, it is especially important that physicians and patients educate themselves and their friends and families about POTS and the needs of POTS patients. For more information about postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, including resources, lists of physicians who specialize in treating dysautonomia, and a community forum for POTS patients, please visit the Dysautonomia Information Network website at www.dynet.org.